Humans of the Cardboard, welcome back to Just Nuts, guys. Today, we need to take a look at Photon Hypernova. We finally have the 80 cards revealed for the core set here. It is our next one after Darkwing Blast, which we are getting in like four days, which is awesome. That's a really good set coming after an even better set, like literally an A plus and A minus set that we're just getting here. This is the next one, Photon Hypernova. We finally have everything revealed. We're gonna take a look at all the, the key points, the most important points from this set uh, real quick. We're gonna skim through everything, not spend too much time on that. And then I'll give you my overall thoughts on this as a set so far and uh, just everything. Uh, you know, kind of just reviewing everything all together. So normally I break this up into three different categories of like types of cards in the set. It'd be new archetypes, support for pre-existing archetypes, and then generic bomb cards. Um, and they're not always bombs, but generic, whatever you want to call it, free agents is what Konami calls them, just kind of generic cards that can be abused in multiple different decks. Uh, there's, new there's no new archetypes in the set. It is only support. But let's start from there. So first, we start out with the cover card, uh, the Galaxy Eyes or the Photon stuff, whatever you want to call it. They get some cool stuff here, uh, but they still stay. Like, maybe they come to, like, low-level Rogue, but I still don't really... They just seem like a bad combo deck relative to any, like, a ton of other decks you could be playing. So, meh. Kshatri La, or Kshatira. Uh, this stuff is actually super relevant. We get them as an archetype in the set before, but they're not really a full-on playable deck. They're just splashable, really powerful individual cards. With the reveal of this set, they actually become a full-on strategy. I believe they will be higher tier. I don't know if it'll be tier one exactly. While I do think they're, that what they can do is pretty powerful, I still wonder about their fragility. It kind of seems like they have one or two card combos, but one interruption could kind of halt them in a lot of situations and just leave them with a really subpar situation. It'll really come down to how well they really combat. I'm not saying they're not. I'm just saying I'm not convinced yet, but we'll see. They're still going to be at least high tier rogue or tier two at worst. Uh, and at best, obviously, tier one meta threat. Cool. Moving on from there, we get chaos support, but this stuff is pretty bad because a lot of it really hardly locks you, uh, which is brutal. Ki uh, Gishi cards. Um, this stuff is interesting, especially because the sprites can kind of work as pretty nasty abusers in this deck as well. So we'll have to keep an eye on this. Although for the most part, as far as competitively speaking, they can rip your hand going first, but going second, they probably still kind of stink. So whatever. Abyss Actors. This one is one that I'm personally interested in. I think they legit become a rogue deck here as a pure variant because of this new support. They get like four new cards and they're all pretty sweet. Uh, if you look at them. So very cool, very interesting to see how legitimately they can play. Uh, a couple insect cards are actually like kind of marketed as Weevil Underwood support. The best of the pure insect stuff here was Giant Ball Shoot. It's a pretty good monster reborn spell with a, with potential uh, bonus effect on a later turn, which is pretty cool. Um, but yeah, nothing too crazy. Just like a couple of okay cards for the most part. Evil Eyes here get a really big buff. I don't know if they'll be a good enough control deck to really jump into a competitive play, but maybe they could be a rogue deck that could see some regional play here and there. I think it does get quite a big buff there. Uh, Dogmatic is stuff, they get a new crazy ritual. Um, it's cool. It, it's a really powerful that it resolves, but it is level 12. So if you can get it out, you can get it out. But if not, uh, you know, it's tough. From there, we also get two more fusion monsters for like the Albaz lore stuff, except one of them has Blazing, uh, Blazing Cartesia the Virtuous in its card text, which means maybe something like Fusion Deployment helps you bring that out or whatever, but also has some extra synergy with that. Uh, pretty good stuff. I think they're both quite good, all things considered. Um, I think I'll definitely be interested to see what people can do because there's just so many different ways you can go with, with Despia and all the different like splashable cards you can do with them. I'm definitely curious to see where people end up with these. Uh, whoa, okay, I accidentally just deleted the Generator uh, Exeed monster. Generator gets a nice little buff here. They get a good main deck monster. They get a good extra deck boss monster. Um, they're still going to be a bricky deck. Uh, the cards definitely help that a little bit, but maybe it helps enough where we could actually see it on the, the regional scene again. It is a really powerful engine. They just always felt like they needed something else to work with that felt really reliable. Not sure if we're there yet, but we'll see. Ninjas also get support here. Really surprised that we get ninjas immediately after the ninjas from last set. Um, and they're nice follow-ups. I think the main deck guy is pretty good and adds uh, something that they were missing. And also this extra deck guy is a pretty good removal card as well. I don't hate it. Ice Jade get a cool new uh, uh, Synchro Monster. It's actually quite generic for like water Synchro decks, which is kind of interesting. But um, it's Ice Jade. They need so much. I'm not sure if these cards truly fix them, but you know, they're nice. Spriggins, 
huge buff to spring. It's another one I'm super, super excited for. Um, yeah, I, they can play. I think they're a legit rogue deck now. I do think they're still not amazing going second, but I could, again, this is another deck that I could see getting a top here or there on a regional scene for sure uh, after this support. Uh, Valance get a new boss monster. It's okay, but like again, I question how easily or like efficiently they make it. So we'll see. Valance pretty, been pretty sus since their drop. New Bistol card. This is a really nice one. Uh, this card fits right in. I think this card probably becomes another staple, but more like Druid Worm than than Magnamute. Obviously, Magnamute's like by far the best one, um, but this one's like right there. It's like right there with Druid Worm on which one you think is actually better. It's quite a good search target. Uh, because it's like an interruption. So if you draw open him like with another Bistral or another way to put a dark monster on field, really good. Also has amazing synergy with Lair of Darkness as well. So we'll see what happens there. That card is really cool. Plunders get a new ship. They finally get the Earth ship everyone's been hoping for. Really nice for them. I think this gives them a nice little boost. Hopefully we'll see Plunders come back as like a really nice rogue deck. Uh, Trivergate get a new Link 5, but I don't think it's that good. Uh, well, Labyrinth gets a new trap card that immensely buffs their consistency. Uh, very curious to see if this actually, uh, you know, it's another nice card. They've gotten two really good support cards. We'll see if they'll be, again, I think that's another deck that could be a regional topper, like legit. Uh, and then we get to the more generic stuff. Um, this card, it's technically an insect support card, but it works with insects and plants. It's a big boss monster. Uh, you, you know, your opponent can't respond to your spells and traps, and you can just destroy all monsters on the field except insects and plants. So it's a pretty powerful card. does take three monsters in Grave to set it up, but it, it could come up here and there. We'll see. Um, Choju with the Trillion Hands. This card looks really weird and really awkward because it you probably have to tribute summon it. But if you get it out, if you summon it, it adds a ritual monster and a ritual spell from deck to hand. That almost entire, that even more makes up the value of the monster you have to tribute. So I could actually see this being not the worst thing in the world for something like Drytron, right? You could just go like, you know, start your play with a Drytron, then tribute the Drytron to summon this, and this gets you double searches. That could, there could be something there. I'm not totally convinced this card is bad. This card, though, is something else. So this is actually another ritual support card as well. It like it's a it's a removal card on summon, which means if you can summon on the opponent's turn, it's interruption, and it quick effect targets a ritual in grave and summons it back if it had already been correctly summoned. There are some amazing um, interactions here. Reborning like the dark magician ritual monster that just like becomes uh, just literally says your opponent gets no monster effects like when it's summoned. So you can do that on the opponent's turn. There's definitely some very, very powerful things with this setup. Uh, we'll have to see. I know dry turns get a lot worse with the Bistral cards, but like this is a nice little piece for them. Nice little bone Konami's throwing them. I like it. I don't think it's like broken, broken. It kind of takes you getting all the way set up for it to be like good. But once you get there, this card is quite good. So I like it. And the final card here, there's like a generic card. And to be honest, like it's really the only like generic, generic bomb card that like any competitive player would probably have an eye on at least. It's typical tactic, triple tactic tasking. Um, it's kind of in the same vein of tactics um, where, you know, uh, you, you have to let your opponent activate a monster effect for it to even be live in that turn. Um, so it can be dead at times, but it is insanely powerful. It pretty much searches any normal spell or trap. Uh, in the game, which is quite insane, um, but it, have, it has its drawbacks for sure. So it's not like a guaranteed every player is going to play it, every player is going to side it, but it is a card a lot of players will probably want to keep an eye on format to format to see if it actually does fit the mold of that current metagame. But uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. That's everything we got. Uh, I got to be honest, all, all in all, I don't know if you guys can get a general feel when I'm talking about everything in tow. This set is not that impactful, and I think this has kind of been a trend. Konami has made a lot of those first set of the year, at least in the TCG. It comes out, you know, January, February. Those core sets that come out early in the year tend to be the most lackluster. Uh, I remember, like, what was it? Blazing, was it Blazing Vortex? Or what, what was that one set called? Whatever's. It had the Springins in it. We got a bunch of really good dogmatic, dogmatic archetypes, and they were amazing. It was like meta after meta after meta, and then we got Springins worst one it was it was a core set at the beginning of the year the only good card in it was like prosperity um this were earlier this year uh the chaos set pretty lackluster overall a couple cards here and there there's always something in a set like it's, it's never going to be a complete dud every single card but relative to like darkwing blast and power of the elements where we got four new archetypes that were legit meta warping in those two archetype in those just those two sets respectively insane now 
I'm going to leave the door cracked a little bit. We are going to get some TCG exclusives. We are going to get some imported cards. If there are some really good stuff there, if the TCG exclusive archetype is straight up meta, that does bump this up a little bit. But this is really lackluster to me. It's a lot of support for archetypes. Now, a lot of it is solid. There's like a handful of archetypes that go from, essentially right now, I would say unplayable, generator, evil eye, uh, spring-ins, right? Uh, Abyss actor on a competitive level. And I would say these decks after this after this wave could win a locals, top of regionals, right? And maybe in the rarest case, top of YCS. I really think a handful of decks do get to like the next level, which is nice for them. But like as far as overall meta impact, it's pretty much like triple tactic tasking and the new Cash Tira wave that makes them like a legit pure deck. And that's pretty much it. So all in all, I'm still going to be excited. I'm still going to have a you know a number of cards I'm going to be looking at. I'm still going to be very excited to see what the new TCG, TCG exclusive archetype ends up being. But as of right now, it's pretty lackluster to me. I'm going to give it a 6 out of 10. I really think this is like pretty weak. You could even go, I could even go 5 to 10. You know what? I'm going to say 5.5 out of 10. Really, really lackluster overall. They keep doing this with the first course of the, of the year. And um, I don't know. Just not a huge fan of them going with that trend. Just really unimpactful. It's not going to be that exciting for the metagame to warp when this new set comes out. Hopefully, it'll come around the time where we have a new ban list as well. So hopefully, we'll be able to like kind of piggyback off of that, making the format exciting. But yeah, that's it for me here. Um, obviously, I want to hear your guys' thoughts down below. If you feel differently than me, please let me know in the comment section down below. Let me know your hopes. Let me know your thoughts just in general on this stuff. I'd love to hear that, and uh, I will catch you in the next video. Thank you so much for watching. Subscribe if you have not yet and you want to see more stuff from your boy down the line. Peace.